thank you uh, to each of you for, for joining us. I'm looking forward to some good conversation uh, about all things audiovisual tech. Uh, and one of the things that we are hoping for for tonight is just for this to be really conversational. So um, please feel free to jump in if you have questions, if there's lingo you don't know, uh, if you are have a follow-up question about something, just feel free to unmute. Uh, if it gets <laughs> Uh, you know, out of hand, we might reevaluate that, but I think it'll be good for us just to have some good conversation. Uh, I've got a poll that I'm about to launch. You should see it um, asking you how much of this you feel like you know. Uh, do you feel like you're a real expert on AV tech or you feel like you have a lot you want to learn still? Um, so if you see the poll, you should see it. Yes, perfect. So just take a second to let us know and we can kind of tailor what we're talking about a little bit to to how the group is feeling. Okay, so looks like we've got 38% who are pretty confident, 63% who say I know a bit, but have a lot to learn. So most people will know some of the main components. We don't have anyone who thinks they're an expert uh, other than our experts, of course. Um, and there's probably still, yeah, there's always so much uh, to learn. Okay, so this is great. So uh, what we're going to do, we have three panelists who uh, are pinned. And so I'm just going to ask them each to introduce themselves um, in just a few a few sentences. So we kind of have a sense of what your setup is that you're you're working with and how you encountered this and where you find yourself most days. So maybe Ben, you can start. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I am my main job is assistant professor of music at EMU, Eastern Manhattan University in Virginia. Um, but uh, how I came about into this area was, I guess I interact with it in that role, but uh, I've spent about a, almost a decade as a director of music in um, church, and the uh, majority of that at a large Mennonite church, where in particular, um, since the pandemic, um, have been uh, helping to plan and implement live streaming technology, and because um, we had just done sermons by audio um, prior to the pandemic, sending that out and, and the services were only in person, but then moving completely to a, a fully decked out, um, uh, scenario. So, uh, that was an interesting experience to, um, have a church council that was behind a fairly large, um, <laughs> purchase. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Daryl. Sure. I'm Daryl newstetter -Barg. Um, how do I end up here? Uh, I work for Canadian Mennonite University in audio and video production, and I work for Mennonite Church Manitoba in communications. And I ended up here through the audio realm, uh, managing a recording studio for uh, a couple decades now, and then um, through a number of other events, ended up doing some big live streaming sporting events. So it happens when you hang out with certain friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we broadcast a number of uh, national cyclocross races, but that's a bike uh, discipline, cycling discipline. And then um, have transi transitioned into some teaching at CMU in the communications department. So I'm an adjunct professor at CMU, Canadian Mennonite University, and have done some teaching in live audio and uh, live streaming. And now this year in even the broader realm of digital media. So, but all at a very intro level, right? So um, I know the intro. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Dee, are you able to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. I will, be, I will sit uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, I grew up in a church. I'm from Lutheran Church, and uh, I started when I was very little. I ended up uh, working with uh, sound and uh, camera from the church. And then I was working in Dubai for 12 years. So mainly I have uh, kind of something. Okay. Thank you. Awesome, that's great. Okay, so um, maybe we'll start our first question with you, Daryl. Um, what would your ideal AV setup be for a congregation that was live streaming if you were starting absolutely from scratch? They don't have anything related to this, so you get to choose whatever you want. 
Oh dear. Uh, and my new little puppy has come running into the room here. Hang on a second. Okay. That's sorry. <laughs> uh, so in some ways, this <laughs> wow, unexpected. Um, sort of a tough question because uh, as I was explaining to Annalie, like there is such a range of possibility in setting up a new live stream for a for a congregation or other institution. Uh, you can start with your phone and go straight to either you know straight to uh, some sort of live streaming platform, whether it's Zoom or whatever, to spending tens and tens and twenties of thousands of dollars on a on a setup. Well, and I often tell my students, I mean, think of what our standards are, right? What What's the equivalent? And they all sit there and think, and I'm like, well, what other live events do we watch all the time? Sporting events, the Olympics, right? So the bar um, in some ways is high, but but we don't have to own that entirely. I'm just trying to help them understand that this is we've got a sort of a massive range of possibility here and the season we're in now is amazing because we can actually access this for for a, so much less than it used to be right so if i was going into a congregation now though um and just sort of starting from scratch and trying to keep it kind of contained i think what i would do is i would center um uh, a live stream around OBS, which is free software. It stands for Open Broadcasting Software. Runs on all platforms. Uh, I would bring probably two cameras in, right? So two cameras uh, allows you to, to cut between different cameras to make different moves so that people don't need to watch you zooming and panning with your camera, right? And it's super inexpensive now to get an HDMI. Uh, I even have one lying here. So right, this little doodad here is 30 bucks. And it it gets your HDMI, which is the sort of that traditional uh, camera digital uh, transmission system for more inexpensive stuff into your computer, right? So I do that all the time with my Mac. Um, I do some live streaming uh, for fun for a few choirs, two cameras into the Mac with these little cheap little $30 adapters into OBS. And then I bring the audio in through an audio interface Right, so it would be a two-channel audio interface, which is a way of getting that audio from whatever your source is into the computer. Right, so uh, so common devices would be like a focus. Really common would be a brand like Focusrite makes a little audio interface box for you know 200 250 dollars, and it lets you either bring two microphones in, or if you need a lot more microphones, it lets you use your mixer and then run from your mixer into this little box, which gets your sound into OBS, right? So essentially paying attention to the audio, doing that well, two cameras, uh, and then using OBS as the video switching system. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. If you were doing that on a Sunday morning, how many people would you think you needed to kind of operate that? Right, so good question. Um, I think minimally, so it depends where your cameras are and what kind of cameras you have. I would say minimally two, including like one person to dedicate it to sound, especially if things are more complex. Uh, and then with the cameras, you can have one always wide, so it doesn't need to be staffed, right? And then you'd have another camera that you could get closer. You go to the wide camera whenever you wanna move the other camera, you zoom in with the other camera to whatever you want, and then you switch them to the close camera, right? So so essentially the other person is is dealing with that. Um, OBS also allows you to bring in other sources, like if you want to put words and text on the screen, but it also allows you to play video from within, right? So if you have a video you want to show, you can play it right through OBS as a source and get that out either to a projector or um, out to the live stream. So minimally two, depends on how complicated you want to get with the cameras, right? Um, we could talk about cameras for a while too, right? There's, I, I mean... Oh, we could talk about cameras for hours. Um, but I will just say people start with things as simple as an iPhone or a phone plugged in so it doesn't the battery doesn't die. Um, you know, and then for like, you know, in the $400 range, you could get an old handy cam, right? Those traditional handy cams that we always used to see people take on their vacations. As long as it has HDMI out, a clean HDMI out, which means that it lets you get that HDMI signal out with all the, you know, the record and all that stuff on the screen. So uh, it's pretty easy to find out now whether a, a little camera allows for clean HDMI out. 
So that's sort of mid-range, right? And then up to higher range kind of standalone cameras. And then the other way to kind of go is you could even have a webcam somewhere, right? Plugged in via USB, or you can have a PTZ camera, which is a pan tilt zoom, right? And those are becoming quite accessible, uh, 12 to $1,500. That's amazing. And then the, actually the, the signal, the video signal runs over a network cable and a, a protocol called NDI. Um, so people are doing that. So you can go different directions with the cameras. Uh, I'm just comfortable like setting up my cameras and going, right? So I like, I I'm not in a situation where I do an installed um, uh, broadcast every week. So that's why, um, that's partly why I would do it that way. Now, uh, I want Benjamin to jump in because his congregation did do some research and they actually ended up in a place in terms of the hub of the whole thing that I'm not even really familiar with. So that's super interesting. Uh, Benjamin, you want to jump in and say what you do? Yeah, as I was thinking about this question, um, I sort of was able to answer it a little bit when we did this in working with a couple others on the team in thinking about, so what is, since we don't do live streaming at the moment and now we have to, what should we do? Um, and so <clears throat> uh, before sort of getting into the live streaming thing, just naming a couple of things, don't forget about like a good, some good quality microphones, if possible, um, for not only in the room with you, but to have a half decent sound streaming out. Um, and obviously, again, there's tiers within that. Um, a mixer with the capacity for as many channels as you are aspiring for. Um, and ideally, good speakers in the room. Um, so th that that would be things. So those are things for. Um, in real time, but, or in, in the space. But and I, was, I was actually skipping audio, just assuming most congregations already had a, had had a go at audio in the last. Yeah. Case. Yeah. No, I figured not all have maybe. So, so in terms of the, yeah. So to Daryl's question there about the streaming, um, what we ended up doing was two cameras. Um, it really is uh, more interesting to look at those two. You can set, um, set placements while the other one's on and, and have some variety and uh, people don't even think about it. You're just so used to seeing, to having that um, stimulation, I guess. Um, and so what we did is the PTZs, the pan tilt zoom cameras. And so that actually you can have a joystick um, and uh, recall systems for where you um, want the camera to um, focus. And so while one camera's maybe has the wide shot of everyone singing. You're setting the second camera to zoom in on the pulpit, and then you switch it when it's the scripture reader. So you can have you can um, do a lot of that. And so those cameras come in to um, the booth and are connected to an ATEM Mini. So that's a um, a camera switching device. Uh, few hundred dollars that just helps you to, um, well, those, yeah, they can do a lot of things in and of themselves. We really just use them as a camera switcher, um, but they can also um, stream and do a number of other things um, with picture overlays and things like that. But uh, all we really did was switch camera inputs and then took it into the uh, computer and used a software called ProPresenter. So I'm a big fan of ProPresenter. It is also a subscription that's a few hundred dollars a year. Um, and so it's not necessarily right for um, all congregations, um, but it is very user-friendly once you mount the learning curve, which is probably true for a lot of things. But um, once mounting that learning curve, then it's a very integrated system to take camera inputs, audio inputs, video files, um, PowerPoint slides, uh, and images and PDFs and everything all in one service flow. And you just click from service, uh, from, from slide to slide or whatever. And it can also integrate um, the camera to have then like text at, in the lower third. So like the this text you're singing will be down here. 
Um, maybe sermon slides will come uh, over the shoulder or that kind of thing. Um, so you can set it up to do all that. And it streams directly then to YouTube or Facebook or something. Um, so it while the the initial cost is a, a thing, it it's partly because then it makes some other things down the road a little easier, or smoother or nicer looking. But um, yeah, and that we did that because we didn't have anything else before it. So yeah. Um, how much of a learning curve would you say figuring out ProPresenter was for you guys, or is it fairly intuitive? Um, no, none of these softwares are fairly intuitive at the beginning, I feel like, because like if if you need to be the one that's setting up all of the the audio levels and the scenes and all of the things. To set. So for me, as the person who set it all up, um, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks of, of YouTube university, yeah. um, <laughs> a lot of watching of videos, both from pro presenter itself. And then also from a lot of other users who had tips and things. And then I did some training videos and some training sessions with our AV volunteers um, just to get them to know it at least how to run things and tell them which things not to touch. Like these are, and so then I also took screenshots of all of our settings because, uh, and sure enough, they came in handy because people touched things they weren't supposed to and I had to put things back to. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it took some time, but then um, it has very few bugs after that. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um. The, I'm going to throw our next question over to you if you're there. Uh, what is one product or app or resource or book or YouTube video or whatever it is that you would recommend to the folks here or a congregation's AV people? Uh, can I answer after him? After yeah, somebody? Yep, yeah, totally. Let's go to Daryl. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually going to dodge this just a little bit. Um, because I don't have something specific, right? Like, like OBS is free, but yeah, it takes some work to figure it out. And there isn't a, a great manual, right? It's open source software. There's great forums, there's all that kind of stuff. So I, I continue to think that OBS is, is amazing, right? So if you just don't have resources, OBS is quite remarkable. In fact, I could use OBS right here now to have a bunch of sources coming in into this Zoom meeting and I could be bringing various cameras and I could mix this all with OBS internally in my computer. So it does some really great stuff. Um, but I actually am pretty passionate about quality audio and think that most live streams fall apart at the audio level. Um, if it doesn't sound decent, I just don't think people are going to stay unless they are highly motivated to stay. If it sounds bad, they will not stay. Right. Like, so I would say invest in ear training for your audio people, mm. frankly, like it really makes such a difference to know what is going on with audio. And it's a bit complicated and we'll probably jump into this a little bit later, but audio for live streaming is often tough because you are taking a mix that's designed for a live space, like a congregational sanctuary. You're taking that mix and typically we're pushing it to the live stream, right? So it was not created for you to listen back on great headphones. It was created for that space. And I can get into the more details on that later. But but typically at the next level of live streaming, you have a separate audio mix, right? You have somebody doing front of house for the, the live space, and then you have a split and it goes to another mixer who is just mixing the audio for the live stream. That's kind of that's kind of upper level, but I know there's congregations that aren't even that huge here in Winnipeg doing that because they they prioritize audio and the audio experience. So, my I don't have a resource. I mean, there Google audio ear training courses, right? You can do yeah, that. That's what I was going to ask. Do you have right? Are they? I haven't done it. I haven't done that because I've spent I've spent slash wasted decades uh, <laughs> learning it on my own, right? And it's an art. I tell everybody. Mixing audio is not technology, it's art, mm. right? Yes, there's a learning curve to the technology, but but what something sounds like and when it sounds good and right, that's art. That's I awesome. usually tell volunteers, 75% art, 25% te technology. 
Mm. If you're not really interested, if you're only here to interested in the technology, then we have a problem, right? Hmm. So, anyways, that awesome. was a that was a bit of a little uh, a passionate plea for good audio, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. And there's um, no magic bullet yet. AI is coming, yes, but it's not yeah. quite there yet in terms of right. live audience. Ben. I mean, the, the main thing that comes to mind is YouTube. Mm. I mean, that is a, a really helpful resource. Um, because I, I've just learned a lot. It's it sounds silly to have a, a college professor say that, but um, I have spent and learned a lot from YouTube um, because it's the most accessible one to learn a class from. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but you have to be really careful. So um, it's helpful if like, you know, you're interested in learning about, you know, something in particular, and then you first spend some time, okay, who actually knows what they're talking about in this? Can I find what they are talking about? Um, and then spend time. Because if you just search for whatever, you'll find all kinds of people um, talking about things and it may or may not be that great. So still still be judicious in what you listen to, but it is a really helpful way to learn a lot of things, especially how to use certain products or pieces of tech. Mm -hmm. um, probably from the mixing side of things, it's a little, you, you'll probably find some some good and some bad a little more often. But um, in terms of using technology, it can be helpful to learn. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, know it's I, will, I will absolutely echo that. Um, having now taught it for a number of years, there are no printed resources really, right? It's just all changing. It keeps moving. Uh, mm -hmm. The software updates, whatever. I mean, it's there is nothing. I always tell my students, actually, I'm, I'm basically giving the tools to be able to search YouTube well. Hopefully. Hmm. And so that's really where you go if you want to know what's changed or what's current, right? That's the, yeah. Or, or yeah, you just sort of follow. I mean, there are articles. I mean, there's some good stuff. But what I've noticed is because I asked students to do presentations on, you know, something cutting edge or something new or interesting in the world of live streaming. And uh, a lot of them, I had to really help them understand that in many cases, they were actually getting this information from manufacturers' websites, mm -hmm. right? So that's really common for in this industry for manufacturers to create good, con I mean, it's called content marketing, right? Like to create good content, but two thirds through the thing, you realize, ah, this is going to their product, right? Like they have shaped this helpful article to end up with their solution. So you just have to recognize if you're on a, if you're on a manufacturer's website versus somebody who's doing this for the good of everybody, right? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube isn't quite so bad for that. Like there's, um, but yeah, like in terms of being confused at first about who, who's, who am I learning from here? But so especially because now they have to disclose if they are um uh if someone is sponsoring their webs their uh that video or if they have affiliate links to purchase those things, you can now see that a lot more. And then it's just like, okay, they're you know, you just have to see where they're being transparent about well, clearly they're steering you to buy this and they want you to buy it on their link so that they get a cut. Um yeah. right. So. Hmm. Yeah. D, do you have any products, tips, resources to add? I want to emphasize on uh, uh, the art part uh, because uh, uh, you, you hear me right, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the more, why I want to emphasize that is uh, especially if it is live uh, streaming, you don't know what will happen. So you can't be ready for everything. Uh, sometimes crazy things happen and then you have to, you have to know what to do and uh, never happened before. So uh, mostly uh, you have to be a decisive person at that time, at that, at that situation, what to do, especially audio sites. Uh, 
video wise, uh, yeah. visual, uh, mostly the camera might not work or stuck somehow, then you have to be able to figure out something and you cannot learn that. Uh, mostly it will be okay, but in many situations, I don't know, uh, uh, some of my friends can't help me, but uh, for, for me, it's always, there is something that I do uh, just out of my sins, you know, mm. to get uh, the point, right? So uh, it's all about ready, readying yourself for the program. Uh, and at the same time, if something happened, you have to just trust your gut and do something, then it will be okay. That's yeah. it. Just, uh, I just want to stress this one. Yeah, this that's part. awesome. Thank yeah. you. Totally. The importance of intuition, right? And and but and the tough thing if that's not something you can like Daryl saying read a manual about. Um, I I wonder if that's we have a young woman at our church who's in high school who's been helping with um, tech at our church and has just been observing uh, and then now helping and I imagine she'll keep going down this road. But I think so great to to watch for a little bit, right, and just kind of see what's happening, see how people who maybe know more than we do are are tackling when things unexpected happen. Um, so great to be able to kind of mentor people in some of those split second decisions, probably. That's awesome. Thank you. I, uh, I don't know how stable your system is, Benjamin, but I mean, good, stable audio installations, things go wrong all the time. It is amazing. Yeah. So just to just to reinforce what he's saying, I mean, things you, you kind of have to have trouble, a, a good troubleshooting workflow mm -hmm. as well, right? Like, I do try to teach my students a bit of a troubleshooting workflow just to start isolating what's going on. Why is this not working? Where, what is working, right? Start isolating what's working and what's not. So. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily matter how much money you've put into those pieces of equipment, the more, the larger and more complicated it gets, the, the more spots that there are those places to troubleshoot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I think I often get into problems because um, a lot of the systems I use, I'm moving all the time, right? So things are getting plugged in and plugged out, or it's in a space where somebody else is using the mixer first and has unplugged this or that. So, yeah. There's a comment there at the bottom. So we going. <laughs> <laughs> These also, yes. that's also difficult, I think. <laughs> so Zoom, Zoom has lousy audio right? It's lousy. So that's why I tell people, I, that's one of the reasons I just tell people to avoid it. It's better than most of the other sort of, sort of chatting platforms, it's better than Teams, better than other things I know of, but wow, the audio is terrible. They did just add new audio settings um, for well, like, like I all the stuff for music, sound for musicians and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of that, I think they've really upped their game certainly since 2020, but you're right. It's so inadequate in so many ways. Yeah. yeah. High fidelity music mode, for example. Right, 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 right exactly. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I want to paint like a, a case study, a hypothetical congregation um, where we would have an acoustic piano, a guitar, a hand drum, and three vocalists who are miked. Um, what are our kind of top considerations if we're working with this hypothetical ensemble? Benjamin, what are our top considerations when we're mixing these musicians? Um, um, what are the things we want to be thinking about with that hypothetical group? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things that come to mind right off the bat, um, and some of them are just um, one's perspective and paradigm about it. Um, but one is keeping in mind um, that they are leading uh, the congregational voice, that that is still um, front and center. Because if it's not, that will influence how it is mixed or how it's done or the volume levels or those kinds of things. So if the goal is still to lead and help teach or bring along the congregational voice, that will help. And so what that means to me, at least, and you know, coming at it maybe more from the music leader side than necessarily a, the hardcore AV guy side, 
um, would be, um, you know, thinking about, so lead vocal being a little bit higher than the harmonies so that the, it, they're not even really thinking about like, okay, so which, which line is the note I'm supposed to be singing? It just tap, it just happens because you're drawn a little bit more to it than the harmonies. Um, keeping in mind that higher notes will already be coming out louder. And so if it's a high harmony, be aware that, you know, you really need to monitor how, how loud that's coming through um, so that the melody, the lead singer can be heard. Um, another sort of overarching thing as much as possible, have a mic available for each thing, have, have an input for each instrument if you're going to send any of this into the live stream. So don't, so the, the, the most ideal scenario is where you can have two outputs, right? One that's going into the speakers for the congregants in the room and one that's going into the live stream because you probably won't need to mic a drum or something in, in the space, but depending on where your mics are, they may pick up a funny sounding portion of the drum through the lead vocalist's mic or the congregational mic. And so um, if you can have a mic that isn't sending anything into the sanctuary, but is sending a little bit into the stream, then that would be something to keep in mind, recognizing that that can be a little challenging at times, um, but some mixers can do that. So, um, some software in the, so like ProPresenter, you can have some manipulation a bit. So there, there are some ways to do that, but, um, and then um, also making the piano is a whole nother art. Um, and um, I'm, I think I'll, those are like sort of the biggest things. If you can think about those paradigms, to me as a leader, that's really important. And then I'm going to let Daryl just sort of jump in with maybe a little more of this. <laughs> if you want to say anything you've learned about making a piano, because, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I've I've made some terrible piano recordings. <laughs> uh, it's a very complex instrument, for sure. But, but maybe that's a great segue into one of the things that I think about when I'm thinking about... Um, mixing uh you know a band or whatever or a larger group at church is monitoring right so so one of the things i mean once you're in a larger space you typically need monitors of some sort for the musicians right like and those would be those speakers you see on the floor that actually give the sound back to them so they can hear themselves kind of in real time right up close rather than hearing the big overhead speakers sort of bouncing off the back wall well the problem with that is that those speakers also put sound into your mix right so you, they have to be the monitors have to be quiet enough that they're not a getting into the mics that they're pointing at it always happens a little bit other monitors from other directions might be getting in so there's just bleeding sounds from all over the place um and then what how, why this is related to micing the piano is that it's very nice to mic a piano with, you know, a nice stereo pair from a distance because it sounds most natural. But in the context of a of a live setting, you basically have to get the mics right inside, right? Because otherwise, you're just picking up the rest of the room, right? Everything else going on in the room. So, so it tends to not to sound quite as natural and rich to start with. Um, and there are some different ways to mic pianos, even with the lid closed, right? There are mics that actually tape onto the inside of the lid. They're called boundary mics. Uh, and they're designed to actually use the whole surface as a as a picking a sort of a pickup plane to make it simple. Uh, so that's pretty common to use a boundary mic inside a piano. Um, but it's it's partly about that whole business of what all is going on in this room, right? Uh, like all those sounds bleeding in and and my my concern is often trying to keep the monitors as quiet as possible, but still enough for the musicians to to actually reference and feel like they're getting something useful. So that's a bit of a monitoring question. And I, I would just affirm uh, Benjamin's initial comment about just the balance of the instruments that we need as we have moved to congregations doing more songs uh, by ear. It is so critical that the person mixing understands where the melody is. Where is the melody? Like I just hear this over and over that 
you know, they push up the vocals and, and in particular, this is even for bands. I tell bands, you know what, like when I'm, when I'm either working with a band or, and have done that at CMU as well with the, when there was a worship band at points, you need to make sure that one person sticks on the melody for the whole song, right? It's very nice to have people jumping all over the place. I'm glad that you can do that. That's very excellent. That's very unhelpful for the people, right? People, people tune into a voice as the melody and that's just super critical for people's ability to participate. So I, I just to affirm that, make sure the melody is heard um, and make sure the sound person knows which is the melody, right? It's not a given. Not everybody's a musician, right? If they're not, then they should have a note mm -hmm. at a, either rehearsal or before church starts. This song, so-and-so is the melody. We need to hear that, right? It can be that simple in terms of uh, instruction. I want to pick up a little bit on something in the chat, Sarah's comment about people moving the mic and the piano, um, which is so frustrating. I can only imagine. And the this is this is a little bit different. It's not this what I'm picking up on, but the kind of community dynamics of shared tech, you know, shared microphones, shared monitors, people move things around. I feel I'm I would say I'm a pastor's kid, so I always feel like I can help myself to anything in a church kitchen. But I think it's the same thing. Like if you've been at a church long enough, it's like these are my microphones. Um, can does anyone want to talk to the kind of like community dynamics of how we talk about like you can't just move the microphones around, you can't just, you know, fiddle with levels unless you're really part of this? How do people navigate that? You know what? I I actually don't. Uh, I I think some people just have to be ready to just kind of scan everything and start from scratch every time. Mm -hmm. Like I I just you cannot assume you're going to walk into church um, and just turn the power button on and everything's going to work. Just never assume that. And in fact, um, I always very deliberately and maybe this is not even nice. Uh, I always zero the I often zero a mixer, which means setting all the settings back to zero after I'm done a mix, like after I'm done a a, a project or an, an event. Um, partly that's my way of making sure the next person comes in and does their, pays attention to the settings that are needed, right? Just, it's just, it's got to be habit in spaces like we have to start from almost from scratch every time, almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, some congregations do definitely lock down their mixer, right? They have the big roll top. Ours doesn't. Ours doesn't. It sits there and it's open and people can just mess around with it. So, yeah, yeah. So that was not really a helpful answer, Sarah, other than to say whoever's mixing better just pay attention and make sure they know that somebody's probably going to mess you up. Yeah. Not on purpose, right? Nobody's nobody's generally being malicious. It's just things move. Thank you. That's great. Um, Daryl, going back to you, can you talk a little bit about recording? If you were wanting to record this case study uh, ensemble that we've got in the sanctuary what are yeah. how do the considerations change um i mean there's not much you can change right other than you because you're in a live space but again if you want a clear recording bleed is a problem right so if you have a drummer who is just giving her right behind the vocalists that's a problem yeah. right like it's gonna be in the vocal mics so how do you start creating separation how do you worry about monitors is it a is it feasible to spread people apart a little bit on a on a platform um that's sort of the the physical part of how microphones work on a stage right like they they pick things up from the sides not as much uh, the mics you use make a difference too right good uh tight super cardioid pattern uh microphones are helpful so they pick up there's certain microphones that pick up more width than others to put it simply um, so it's pretty important that you don't get the ones that really grab everything from the side. Um, so space, the microphones you use, uh, distance to the microphone for everybody, right? Good mic technique, like you need people on the microphones, having people stand two feet away from a a, a live a microphone designed for live use is not good because then people will turn. So these are the basics. Then obviously at the other end, you actually need a system that can record all the channels separately so that you can mix it later. Unless you're actually, or or unless you're mixing live. Uh, to, are you talking about live to the live stream or recording, a re like making a recording to share? I mean, either I was thinking a recording to share. 
Yeah. Yeah, then it sure is nice to be able to have a way of getting each one of those instruments, each track into the computer. Not all mixers do that. Some do, they allow you to plug it straight into the computer. Some don't, some allow you to record um, like straight out of the mixer onto a, onto a, 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 a like a SSD hard drive. Um, there's different formats, but somehow you need to try to get some set the separate tracks uh, out of the mixer into a computer. Yeah. Is that helpful? I mean, yeah, I don't know how much people are doing that. Frankly, we were. Like at, at our church, we recorded a lot of pre-recorded a lot of our music for a season there. So we were just doing straight recordings in the sanctuary, mm -hmm. like live band, but no congregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that was a real scenario that we did deal with. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. D, do you have anything you want to add about live streaming with this kind of fake ensemble that we're talking about and any considerations for sound particular around live streaming? Uh, mostly we use like a uh, studio, uh, uh, like softwares like Cubase, uh, it, it can help you divide all the ins, uh, it, it, it needs a little bit, uh, setup and a little bit professionalism, but that, that can help you adjust after the recording you know it if it is live it will not be the same uh, right. at the, the studio so you can work with that even sometimes in in back home what we do is if there is a messed up situation even they can come back to the studio and then uh, redo it again uh, like as if it is live so yeah one technique that uh, I used. That's awesome. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Oh, good, Daryl. So, uh, sure, I'll I'll just jump in with that as well. Like one of the so what I was alluding to earlier about the different mix for live stream versus the sanctuary is, and and Ben actually alluded it to it or spoke about it as well, saying you should mic everything, but not send everything through the front of house speakers. Right, everything should go to the live stream but not everything needs to come back into your room. Because if you have a medium to smaller size congregation and you have a drum kit in there, you don't need to mic it in the space, right? Because it's just gonna, right? It'll just, but people are only gonna hear a sort of a faint echo of it bleeding through the microphones in the live stream. And it's just not gonna be very satisfying. Also things that have a lot of bass or low mid content tend to rattle around in a room, right? So often we set up our sound systems to pull out a lot of the low mid sounds, that really muffly low stuff that happens in rooms because all rooms have a have a, a voice, right? That and, and those lower mid frequencies build up in spaces. So we, we carve them out of our mix and then send that to the live stream and it sounds super yeah. thin and abrasive, right? So, so that's why it's always a problem. Um, if you have a, if you're really kind of designing a mix for a, a big live space and then trying to send that same thing to the live stream. Hmm. Yeah, what you have to do is uh, you have to understand the live audience and then you have to understand the recorded or what the online uh, audience. So they need separate sound mix. So you have to be, you have to make sure that you have two separate person working on different. In AMBS context, me and Brent, we work different, you know, that's, that's uh, how you do it. If you have a live stream, especially, you need somebody who's dedicated for that. Yeah, yeah. Right. And we talked about a lot of congregations just don't have that, right? They don't have a splitter and another mixer and another volunteer, right? So that's, that is the challenge. There are some ways to set up a mixer so that it does some of that carving out of the mid, low mid frequencies after the point where you send it to the live stream, right? Mm -hmm. So you can send it to the live stream via an auxiliary channel that doesn't have all that equalization on the main front of house channel. So it's not as thin at least, but but you kind of have to know your mixer and your routing then if you want to use, if you want to build a separate auxiliary mix to go to the live stream. 
And then that's all the person doing live sounds kind of concern on one mixer, right? Unless you have one of those mixers that has a tablet that somebody can run the aux mix off of a tablet. Yeah. Now, I think we, we may be getting a little too technical for some people. I don't know. Um, we haven't heard anything about what people are actually trying to do here. So I don't know this, if this is helpful. Right, right. So I'm, I'm keeping that on the time. I want to talk a little bit about projection. Um, before we go to projection, we have this question about how loud is too loud and who gets to make that call. Um, Daryl, is there anything you want to kind of say about that that we haven't touched on? <laughs> well, Benjamin, Benjamin stepped into it, and I, I will slightly disagree with him uh, right off the hop. Um, too loud is when there's hearing damage, um, right? Uh, after that, after that, it is about community discernment, right? Mm -hmm. And it should not be just the discernment of the sound person. Mm -hmm. That should not be the case. It should never, right? We need to recognize that when you push the volume up on the band or whatever it is, that changes how people engage in worship, right? So I think this is a theological matter. I think it matters. I think there are congregations that absolutely want to hear their voice and everybody's voice together. I mean, right, we still have congregations that do a cappella. That's absolutely fantastic. And that's what they should be doing if that's what they decide, right? No sound system. But if you've got a band or some instruments or some people leading from the front, you kind of need to understand whether their role is, like Ben said, in leadership, giving voice to the congregation, or, and I've read a bunch about this too, like in the broader um, contemporary worship music scene, a lot of those band folks consider themselves priestly. They are actually kind of doing the worship on behalf of the congregation. Not very Anabaptist, Mennonite, right? Like that's not the way we roll. It's not the way I prefer it. But we need to recognize that there are, that is how, how it's handled in different congregations, right? And some people love that. There's lots of people that go to those churches who would just absolutely not want to hear their or their neighbor's voice. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's how the, the community has to discern the volume. What I think often happens in our congregations that are sort of middle of the road is we get somebody doing sound who's really enthusiastic about it and likes to hear what they're doing. And yes, it sounds better when it's louder, better. We, in fact, they have done lots of tests on our ears. Uh, the louder something is, the better it typically sounds to us. It's called the Fletcher Munson curve. It's the way our ears respond to volume. So, so it's a real challenge to bring the sound of the band down and let it just ride just right above this, the volume of the congregation, right? So I think it's theological, but I think it's also just practical. Most of the people we choose to do sound are, uh, okay, should we get stereotypical about this? <laughs> are either older guys who like technology or younger people who like technology and music and wanna just hear it, right? And, and they're a little often left to their own devices because nobody knows what to say. They don't quite know what to say until it's gotten too crazy and they somebody taps them on the shoulder and say, turn it down, right? Like that's too late. That's too late. Mm. Volume needs to be discerned within the congregation. Is that helpful? Mm. That's, that's really long. helpful. Yeah, no, that's excellent. That's excellent. It's my little uh, rant on volume. Okay, that's perfect. I want to acknowledge William's question in the chat and I think we'll come back to that Daryl's kind of touching on that a little bit now too um so let's come back to it but let's talk quickly about projection um Benjamin best practices who gets to decide who I mean I always love who gets to who has to whose job is it to make the slides um what are some of the dynamics here about what we want to be looking at and how we figure out what that is and you're particularly talking about on the screen during a service yeah okay yeah, so I mean, in terms of just a couple thoughts on best practice, one is um, it it is better to have a black background with white text, um, and so uh, for the, whether that be scripture reading, call to worship, song lyrics, um, airing on that side, um, and test it out in your space. So, like, what is the size that's needed? So, try some different options of text size. Um, from you know different vantage points across the sanctuary, um, can it be read in the back? Those kinds of things. Um, 
I would say also that there are um, some wonderful resources already in existence. So the projection edition of Voices Together, for example, if your congregation uses Voices Together, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, is a really good resource because it already has everything in nice forms. So PDF, PowerPoint, rich text, um, it often exists for worship resources and songs. In addition to just the lyrics, um, there are also the music slides. And so that's a good way if you are doing a lot of things from the screen, but you still want to be able to see four parts and people aren't looking at their books. Um, it has been rewritten uh, in music notation form for projection. So there's only one verse of text per line of music, and it can be in ridiculously large font uh, with the notes. And so uh, if you've ever tried to like take a picture of the hymnal page or some other page or something and you throw it up on the screen, um, it's it, it was a nice idea, but it doesn't work really work for anyone. And so it's sort of, yeah. Um, so the, it's it has a bit of a sticker price on it, but that's because it's a pretty amazing product and took a lot of hours to to make. Um, and then in terms of I I sense part of the question might be getting at some aspects of aesthetics. And that I think um, that comes down to a lot of personal preference too. And and um, oh, thanks. Yeah, that's the um, music notation slides with four parts, and so you can get a whole phrase in um, in one slide. And we we did try it reverse with like black with white notes, but that is just super weird. Anyways, yeah, it's <laughs> it's too different than what our brains are used to. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to answer any sort of aesthetics from a from the um, artistic or, or graphic side because that sometimes depends on themes or people's yeah. Um, but I mean to to sort of tie it into Daryl's thing on volume, any of these things ideally would be had in conversation with leadership or with a, a pastoral team or with just the fact of having a conversation with folks in the booth is really important and somehow also very novel. Um, but it, it, they are a part of the team. Um, if the slide does not get advanced, the congregation does not sing. That's a really crucial role. Um, so if, I mean, if, if, if people are watching from a screen, um, so yeah, the, just having conversations about these things. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Ding, uh, D, any, any tips for people who are wanting to get into AV who are like, where do I start? Uh, where do they start? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it depends, you know, uh, like if you are, in Africa, it's different. If you are in the US, it's different. The context and uh, the, the money that is put in, it's also, uh, it depends. But the, the core point is the first thing, why are we here in, uh, in the first place? Uh, just to make the sound right and uh, to, have the best uh, possible uh, program that whatever the presenter is presenting uh, to smoothly addressing to the to the people. So we are just a server in between the the, the message and the people. So. To understand that, and then uh, to avoid any problems in between, uh, to make it sound better, and uh, it, it depends. Like uh, then, once you are in, then you get used to it. So you start from the smaller ones. To I I, I trained two kids to teenage boys last time. Now they are professional, like uh, they're not professional, but they are just handling all the church uh, production. So uh, it's not that much too complicated. 
but you can make it complicated. Yeah. Uh, it depends where you want to stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what your congregation also really need. Sometimes you, you overdo it and uh, you become more destruction, kind of. Mm. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Uh, so it's, it's just uh, amplifying whatever the message is, like mm. understanding that we are a servant. I think that's the starting place. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah I really like that. Thank you. Um, this also kind of leads into this question in the chat on managing high expectations, kind of like what Daryl mentioned at the beginning of like, our framework is the Olympics often. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, we all consume professional media. This is the question. Yes, we have a variety of hearing abilities, but this is all we can afford. We need a community of grace to retain volunteers, etc. How do we, how do we manage that hundreds of people may have an opinion about how this should be done? Mm -hmm. I'll write a couple of main, main things. Like the first one, you have to achieve a balanced mix. In any case, you have to have some kind of balanced mix. If that's not the case, then even if you are professional, whatever, you are not doing it right. So you have to have a balanced mix. The second one, uh, there will be an argument always between the speaker and the, the sound man because we see in different angle, they see in different angle. So you need to be patient and uh, understand the situation. And then like uh, most of the sound man, they are kind of comedy, you know, it helps, you know, to smoothen some Tensions. That's that's also you have to under, understand. And uh, the third one, uh, you have to be at least uh, decide what is what at at the last moment. Don't leave the sound to somebody. I see it more many times. You are the sound guy, so you have to fix that. If this is the minimum, mm. the minimum requirement in my, uh, whatever sound you have, you have to decide the first thing, you have to understand, you have to balance it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the disagreement time, just make it smooth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks, Dee. Okay. That's great. Anything else? No, that's excellent. Anyone else want to add anything on this? managing high expectations? Well, yes, we've got a couple of good questions about volunteers, right? Um, if volunteers don't feel like they're, uh, I don't want to say being appreciated, but if if they feel like people think it's not good enough, good luck, right? Mm -hmm. You are not going to retain volunteers. You're not going to get new ones. So mm -hmm. it's true. I And I, I have to be honest, um, in terms of Will's comment, the community of grace, I love that. Uh, I think that's just super critical, but I actually don't quite know how congregations always navigate that. I, I don't feel like I've ever observed that being navigated. Um, in our context, the congregation I met most recently, I was in charge. Um, we sort of set the bar and I train and train and train. As And I'm a volunteer too, right? So there Sunday after Sunday when people are new, making sure helping, you know, when something goes wrong, teachable moment, time, it takes huge amounts of time. And, I, and in some ways, you can only get as far as the person doing the training, right? That's also a, a, a factor. So I, I don't quite know when, when congregations determine when it's time to hire someone. I don't know of a congregation that does at this point. Not true. Actually, I know of one congregation, Mennonite congregation in Winnipeg that pays somebody to do their live stream. Hmm. So mm -hmm. they have a pretty complicated system, but so I all to say, I don't know. 
right? Like I know how I needed to try to care for my volunteers. That's all I could do. Because people, people aren't really interested in the conversation at the congregational level. I don't think that was my sense. It's like, get it done. So that's pretty unhelpful. I know. Another thing I think in some contexts where Daryl and I have both been leading and maybe um, contacts with our colleague Sarah Johnson too, talking about like you are worship leaders, like empowering this as part of like a really valued contribution to the worship um, and making sure that that's listed in the bulletin or mm -hmm. if, I mean, not a big fan of thank yous during worship services, but if there were that that would be part of it, you know, like making a really clear point that this is a, a really huge contribution. Um, and I, I, one of the things I heard from pastors early in the pandemic was like, I don't want to be learning how to live stream. Like I have 1000 other things I want to be doing. Um, and learning how to live stream isn't one of them. And so I think saying like, this is a huge thing that you are doing on behalf of this community. Um, but as I'm saying that, I don't think I've made that public in my community enough recently either. So yeah, I think it's tough. When I was teaching students, I always told them to be prepared to be ignored. Yeah. If you're going to do audio, because I can, I can stand outside that booth and everybody comes by and says, hi, as soon as I'm standing beside that booth, I disappear, like inside the booth. People will just walk by and not even make eye contact. It is fascinating, fascinating. So the only time they know you're there is when, you guessed it, something goes wrong, right? And it may not even be your fault. Somebody else turned that wireless microphone off up at the front when they weren't supposed to, they start talking, there's no sound, right? Guess what? where all the heads look everybody knows what <laughs> sound then <laughs> so there's my little rant you have to you do have to have a servant's heart to do this job i think and i think leadership can really play a role yep. in helping to change the culture around that too to just say i mean just annalee like you were saying but to to enforce the importance or to, to um emphasize the importance of their role in worship I think that can actually help get volunteers when you say, you know, we couldn't do this without these folks. So, like during an announcements time, let's say, and you're like, okay, we need four more volunteers for AV, um, for help with AV. And this is why it's important. Like if you, uh, and that's part of why when we got the um, PTZs, uh, I said, it's really like playing a video game back there. You're like moving the the camera around with this joystick. It's really fun. Um, and, and our, our folks that can't come in right now or are traveling or our shut-ins or, you know, they're able to come into worship with us. And, you know, so there, there are a number of ways, but I think to, to, to make it more than just, you know, yeah, it's a thankless job that, um, everyone hates getting up for, you know, <laughs> and then to also be the kinds of leaders that don't turn their heads when something goes wrong. Like, so if there are leaders in here, like when something happens, be like, yeah, you know, um, uh, lead by example to be that community of grace. Uh, it goes a long way in, in helping to shift that culture. Great comment, Sarah, by the way. Yep. Yeah, kind of demystifying it, right? What's what's actually going on? Let's let's go check. Let's go look. Hmm. And and it but but it is tough though, right? Because if you're in a situation where things haven't actually been going that well, and then you ask for volunteers. Like it feels like the timing's off, right? Like, oh boy, am I joining a sinking, right? Like, so I don't bite off more than you can chew, I suppose. <laughs> what we found when we said, you're welcome to join us in the sound booth, um, come and see what we're doing. They went, oh no, um, that's okay. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you so mm. much for everything you do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> totally uh well i'm aware of our time here any other questions uh or comments other things that you haven't heard mentioned that you want to share you know your own experience with the group too um anything you've learned or other things you want to ask our panelists before we wrap up i'd like to hear more about <clears throat> miking the congregation we mm -hmm. have uh one Sunday a month, we have a band that plays, and that's really frustrating and hard to get mixed well the way our system is, but I've managed to do okay. But my priority is that I want voices in the congregation heard. Other Sundays are most a piano in congregation, but still to get a good congregation sound, we've got two mics up front on the stage that are cheap, but fairly good for what they do. 
and I also have mostly for backup. I have my iPhone in back with a Rode video mic on it, mm -hmm. and so it's behind the congregation, collecting everything in the room and back off the wall. And to mix those together sounds okay. I pretty pleased with what I have compared to a lot I hear on YouTube. So our live stream is Zoom. It goes to Zoom, mm -hmm. but then we record that and I edit it at home, spend my Sunday after my volunteer Sunday afternoons editing all those at home to put on. So it's you can cut out all the stupid things people say. That's half the not not the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> so just to get a good sound for that, the audio the congregation that's very important to me and i'm sort of curious i would like to get do better with that maybe i need to spend more money well i think part of your problem is zoom right like well we're recording zoom, to is, in mon like, zoom is in mono so part of that we're, we're going to obs oh you right and obs is going to zoom yeah and so and our recording is on obs so it's oh it is oh, yeah, oh okay it's recording. To start recording oh, you are recording on obs okay good so yeah good but then how, when you bring the audio in, are you bringing it? So you're not, obviously you're not feeding any of that congregational sound back into the congregation. You're using it. It's going, mix. It's going from you? our mixer and we get everything all in one. Everything we have comes to our ah, focus, okay. right? Scarlet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Scarlet, of course. So it's a nice stuff, but there's no mixing of any, any of that until right? afterwards. So then you're I actually can, pushing it into the house. So to actually have enough. Actually the house and then. The congregation mics aren't going into the house. They're oh, just they're not. Going, okay. No. We also have a piano that it, it's loud enough so it doesn't go into the house. It's just going for the That's recording sweet. and stuff like that. Well, where but are I you monitoring, know. Phil? How, at what point are you monitoring it all? When I make my re editing at home and I say, huh. No, like as, as no, somebody's no, mixing it live. It. I just said it. And I go back next week and said, that was a little too loud or that wasn't quite right. I'm making that adjustment on the main mixer board the next week to say, oh, okay, that sounds better now. Okay. Because uh, that's the other not, option, it's right? It's not it's ideal, to, but... Try to monitor what you're sending to to the... Or actually monitor it right off the Scarlet, right? Like it's coming yeah. from your mixer to the Scarlet. You should be able to just plug headphones into the Scarlet. Yeah. Some reason, yeah, maybe... That's... It might have been something in an earlier version that didn't work well for us, but maybe hmm. I should retry that. Yeah, monitoring is kind of important, right? To know what you're sending... <clears throat> Yeah. I'm getting, I do pretty darn good with what I got, but nice. <laughs> but just to make a better, I don't know if it's just better microphones needed or placement of microphones or. Well, I'm not sure. Have you ever stood, just out of curiosity, have you ever stood where those microphones are, like in the congregation when they're singing? Mm -hmm. Like, is it actually a good sound in that spot? Yeah, it's not far from where a song leader would stand. They're okay. on the stage up front, one on each side. Right, like a pair, a pair of even inexpensive condensers should do the job, right? Small that's diaphragm that's, condensers. That's what's doing, and that's not bad, I guess. I just want better. <laughs> it it, would, it might be a question though, still of how they're being EQ'd into the mix too, right? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that can. Hmm. But anyway, I find it very important though to get a congregational because that's what we're into. Yeah. I don't want right. to hear a band. Well, and I even find for for when I mix a band in a in that sort of scenario, I I still run um, other mics in the mix too, right? So I'd rather get some of the room sound of the band than the direct instruments because there's no reverb, there's nothing, there's no space around the band. So I will actually add just room mics when the from the back when the band is playing, mm -hmm. if we don't have a better, more comprehensive system. So. I know there's not a good answer to this, but also band people who think it sounds good to me up here. I don't need to turn that up or down. I hear it just fine through my monitor and don't really care what you say. Well, yeah, there's, there's it might so sound okay here and it might sound okay live, but you guys sound really, really bad over the recording because at first I had three voices very close to a microphone and you hear no piano, no guitar, and they're not that good of voices. And it sounded so bad that I, part of the editing was sorry there's no music this week oh you yeah. don't want to hear yourselves really you sound better live but that really sucks <laughs> it <laughs> kind of goes into this community decision thing right of like, like they don't like, care they don't realize this together yeah or they go back to what well, sounded okay on the recording to me yes yeah, so, yeah i spent a lot of hours trying to make that sound okay <laughs> mm -hmm. interesting that's that's tough to do later phil in a in a stereo mix hey like that's pretty rough that really in a lot of ways that's just too late 
Um, that's why I I would suggest still monitoring for sure. Yeah. Like using head good ceiling headphones to try to try to get a sense of what's going to the recording. Anyway, YouTube Albany Mennonite Church. Check it out. See how I do. Albany. <laughs> okay, okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. Is actually. there any? Uh, we're, we've got some good action in the chat. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, some good suggestions for how people are doing this. Um, so I'll, we can let that keep rolling for a second, but any other kind of final questions or comments? Well, this has been great. Thank you to all of you for joining us. It's been really rich conversation. Good to hear that so many of us are kind of wondering about the same kinds of things. Um, so thank you so much to Dee and Daryl and Benjamin for sharing your expertise with us. I know this is hours of training and learning that you've done on your own. And so thank you for, for offering that to us. Um, this was recorded, so it will be up on our Anabaptist Worship Network uh, YouTube channel shortly. Um, and you can find it there and always reach out with uh, questions if they come up and we can try to connect you to the right people. So um, thank you all so much for being here. Have an awesome night and blessings to you in your AV ministries. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.